So the moment came when the three travelers from the East, who were the first of the diaspora of the mysteries, departed from that cave near Katsika and departed from the people who were there. And when they left the mad monk and his handlers, consisted of five or six scruffy-looking scruffy characters, were left in a state of consternation, but also in a kind of relative calm. Truth be told, there was not a lot of calm, and certainly calm without fear, in the place where they lived. The cave itself was terrible, an opening into the maw of hell. And they even fancied that the skull of death was present to them and that the powers of death and the, and the reach of the satanic forces was acting on them in that cave. In fact, they lived in the presence of an uncanny object, a skull of death, that the mad monk, whom some might call John or Eoanes, considered to be the face of Satan, who had been thrown down into the earth by the archangel Michael. Well, it was odd for those men in that place to feel peaceful and rested. But that was in effect how they felt after the visit of these strangers, which had lasted about two, almost three weeks. They went about their business quietly. They did not talk much. The monks around the central one, the mad monk, busied themselves with fragments of parchment. They were composing a book, but it was not a book that would be bound as the books that were found in Egypt in 1945. Rather, it was just a parchment scroll whose chapters and episodes were a compilation they made based on the spontaneous visions of the mad monk. In that period of restful quiet and uncanny tranquility that ensued after the visit of the mysterious strangers, the mad monk was less apt to shake like an epileptic when his visions seized him. He had in some way been comforted by the presence of those strangers and by the long talks, the long and quiet talks in which they had engaged him. His habit of snatching pieces of parchment upon which the other monks had written down his visions and eating them was momentarily abated. But little by little, the terror came back. Feeling of terror in that dark and dank place where the formations of the earth were like long teeth of demonic forces embedded in the bowels of the earth. Long teeth descending from above and ascending from below that would eat the human soul and render it to annihilation. And there was a sense of terror and an atmosphere of terror in the presence of those teeth as if they represented the mouth of Satan frozen into a perpetual scream. Little by little, 
the monks pulled together the fragments they had written on pieces of parchment and compiled them on a single parchment. And in doing so, they attempted to give some continuity and order to the visions of the mad monk. They attempted to script his message in a coherent fashion. And to do this, they used certain devices of scripting, which were typical of their time and of their religious background. So they used sequences of numbers, such as the seven angels and the seven trumpets. And they used sequences of appearances of supernatural beings, such as the four horsemen, in order to give succession and linearity to what was otherwise a completely turbulent and chaotic mass of visionary symbols and images, many of which were even impenetrable to them. And little by little, they achieved their goal of composing the Apocalypse, the Book of Revelation, that would be attributed to the mad monk. And as their work came to a close, after some months, the monk himself underwent a kind of transformation. He became dull. He lost the shiver and the rush of that visionary power that had poured through him. And it was as if he became even somewhat immune to the atmosphere of terror that permeated that cave. He became, as it were, apathetic and indifferent to the presence of the skull of death, the leering, empty eyes of the face of that old devil, of that satanic power cast down out of the sky. He understood, as they did, that when the red dragon with seven heads and ten horns was cast down by Michael, The triumph of the Almighty Lord and his host was guaranteed. It was guaranteed. And everything else was really anticlimactic. Everything else that happened in the vision was simply the upheaval, the series of catastrophic upheavals, the plagues and the wars that ensued on earth due to the fact that the red dragon had been cast down into the earth where he could be seen frozen in terror right before their eyes. And as they completed their work and as they conversed with the mad monk at moments when he came out of his listless apathy and was available to talk, they all agreed that the figure of the beast that rose from the sea with seven heads and ten horns and the lesser beast like unto a lamb with two horns that rose from the land and the harlot of Babylon who rode upon the great beast. They agreed that these monstrous visions could not possibly threaten the plan and power of the Almighty Father God. But there was a logic in the visionary madness communicated to them by those three strangers. There was a logic. And they understood, the monks understood, the necessity of the presence of those three monstrous forces but they did not understand the three clues the tall woman had given to John at the last moment. Nevertheless, due to John's own insistence, they included them in the final version of their text. And as their work came to a conclusion, 
They felt a kind of sense of relief and a huge letdown. They really did not know where their mission for God in service of the plan of God and of the divine redeemer would take them. They really did not know what the Lamb of God would require of them next. And then one evening, it was a warm evening in the beginning of summer and warm air came off the sea down by the rocks and by the coast and spread across the land, spread across the rocks and hillsides and filtered gently into the mouth of the cave. And on that evening, the mad monk fell into a light sleep. He was not sweating or convulsing as he had so often done. But he lay there like a man relieved, wrapped in his meager robes. propped against some leaves and some plants that had been provided for a dry bed. And as he slept, he did not entirely sleep, but he woke in the dream without waking in the cave. And when he woke, he saw that woman that tall woman, Zophrastus, standing before him, just as if she were real, just as real as she had been in that last moment of intimate exchange between them. Looking upon her form and figure, he was momentarily rendered immobile. He was paralyzed where he stood, for he stood in the dream the lucid dream, though he lay horizontal in his dreaming state. And he felt a vast force rush through his body, causing him to tremble in the deepest way he had ever known. And he felt suddenly something like a crack or snap in his chest, And then it was as if his whole body was melting like wax. And he thought that he would melt like wax into those wax-like formations of terror that filled that cave. And as he felt himself on the verge of melting, the woman stepped forward once, twice, three steps. She came to him and she raised her right hand And she put it out as if she were going to grasp a large melon off a tree. She put it out and she placed her hand on his face and held his face gently but firmly in her right hand. And because she did that, the mad monk was able to stand on his feet, to remain standing. And the feeling that he would melt away into the, into the formation of the cave and become another grotesque structure of subterranean matter immediately vanished. And he felt something like affection and gratitude for the hand that actually held him in life held him from dissolving into the infernal worlds. And she held him steady that way for an unknown time. The moments could not be counted. They were only minutes, but they were long minutes, long, long minutes, minutes dripping from the current of eternity. And eventually he felt a slight jolt as she drew her hand away and pulled it back, holding it still up at the level of her shoulder, her right shoulder, 
and holding it still open in the same way, with the fingers slightly curved and the thumb brought around as if she were still holding his face, gripping his face gently to support him. His eyes were riveted on her eyes, but he could not look into her eyes because the currents of magenta light were too powerful for him. But anyway, she directed him by her glance to watch her hand. And so he turned his eyes slightly to her hand. And then he saw in that part of her hand at the base of the thumb, halfway between the base of the thumb and the base of the index finger, a hole. There was a hole in her right hand. It was about the size of a twig of a tree, about the size of a pebble that you could roll between your fingers. And as he saw this hole open in her right hand, he also saw a soft, sweet, pulsing light come through that hole and flow toward him. It was a soft, pearly light glowing with hues of pink and amber and it flowed toward him like a smoky plume but of some kind of marvelous substance that he could smell and it smelled like ambrosia. And as he gazed at that spot in her hand he saw that she moved her hand slightly back and forth and as she did the pulsing plume of pearl-like light reached him. She pushed the plume toward him so that it came to him and covered him in a gentle coating. Then she pulled her hand away and she drew the plume back and away from him. And she did this again for an undetermined time as if she were massaging him with the light that proceeded from the hole in that part of her right hand. And then, when he felt emotions that he could never describe to anyone, and emotions that he would never experience again, true emotions of bliss and surrender, She called his attention to another motion of her hand and she brought it around and turned it so that the palm faced herself now. The palm faced her own body and he watched as the looping light that came through the hole in her hand made a kind of figure eight or infinity symbol on each with one loop coming from the palm of her hand and one loop coming from the back of her hand. And as she showed him this marvelous sight, the two loops slowly pulsing on each side of her hand and joining and crossing at the hole in her hand, she smiled to him as if she were happy to show him this and as if she were offering a plaything to a child. She smiled to him to show the pleasure that she had to reveal this plaything, this white luminous double arc of infinity playing in her hand. And then, as she brought him and held him in this perception, just at the limit of what he could tolerate, just at the limit of what he could stand to see, what he could bear to see, She moved her hand until the fingers were horizontal, pointing to her left, and the thumb was pointing up. And she brought that place in her hand where the point was located toward her face. And she laid the hole in her hand at the center of her forehead, 
and closed her eyes with the palm of her hand. She shielded her eyes and the whole upper part of her face with the palm of her hand while she held that point in the center of her forehead. And then he looked closely at her in a sense of total awe, a feeling of being overcome, of seeing something greater than he could behold. And he saw that her lips were moving, but they were moving silently. Her lips murmured. They murmured and they spoke, but they spoke in words of silence. And that was all that he could bear. All that he could bear was to see the tall woman murmur. And the intensity of that sight was so great that it threw him out of the lucid dream and threw him down, back upon that bed of plants and leaves where he awoke to the soft and fragrant breeze from the sea.